Okay, so we have with us today a couple of new faces, um, guests, uh, Christian, Eddie, and Michael. Um, um, we'll speak to them in a minute, but we're having this call at all different times of the day. Um, so thank you, those of you who are staying up late and enjoying uh, intercontinental scheduling fun. Um, so yeah, but we are here today for a slightly different episode um, to discuss a topic which remains very popular in discourse land. Um, I suspect the three of you might be slightly sick <laughs> of discussing that, um, but in any case, it's the origins of COVID and in particular, whether it is likely that it originated from a laboratory leak and what the relevant area evidence is. Um, so this is a topic that it's alleged most recently by Alina Chan and Matt Ridley on Sam Harris's uh, quite popular podcast, uh, alleged that it's taboo, cannot be discussed by relevant experts, and that indeed there might be a corrosive campaign of silence uh, to, to prevent dis discussing it. And uh, we hopefully will demonstrate that that is not exactly the case. You know, people could look at your publication record or just look at podcasts on YouTube. But um, in any case, thank you all for coming. And uh, yeah, that's Matt. Is there anything you'd like to add there before I move on to questions? Nothing to add, Chris. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Yeah. yeah, so Matt and I are going to play the role of uh, people just asking questions with um, <laughs> posing concerns that people might have. But before that, uh, it might be useful for people we've, we've already introduced you in our way. Um, but if we take each of you individually, uh, would it be possible just to briefly summarize what your main academic area of expertise is and how you are involved with the this topic or how you got involved with this topic of COVID origins. Um, maybe if we go clockwise. So for me, Eddie, uh, that that's you at the start. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Um, so I was involved. I'm, an, I'm a virologist and evolutionary biologist at the University of Sydney. I've been working on viruses for okay, over 30 years now emerging viruses like this. This is one of a chain that I've been looking at. Um, and I got involved in this because I was involved, some of you may know this, I was involved in the very early release of the genome sequence of the virus back in the, you know, the early January 2020. And then shortly after that, um, I was hooked into this topic by, by um, and I'm sure we'll get to this, by, um, by Christian and people at like Jeremy Farrer. And I've been involved in, in every day since every day since january every single day this has been a, this has been an interest to me so that's that's kind of my background mm. uh then next michael yeah um so i'm a professor and uh, head of the department of ecology and evolutionary biology at the university of arizona um, and I actually worked with Eddie in Oxford um, on virus evolution, and I'm uh, getting close to 25 years into to that the the same line of work. Uh, have done a lot of work uh, specifically on the origins of pandemic viruses, including HIV and uh, influenza, um, and my sort of first foray into the emergence of this pandemic was into um, how, how it started spreading in Europe and North America and some of the techniques, methodology that my colleagues and I developed for that work um, has then carried through to a series of studies, uh, including ones with Eddie and, and Christian um, that have helped elucidate the the most likely scenario for how the this pandemic started. Uh, and Michael, just before I ask Christian, I uh, I think it might be useful for people to know as well that uh, we'll we'll get into the details. But there's been a bunch of you know various controversial letters and publications. But 
is it fair to say that uh, initially that you were uh, relatively more positively disposed to the the possibility, the evidence being, you know, uh, more unclear about laboratory, uh, a laboratory possible origin or natural leak, and that you've since kind of your position has evolved over time because I remember that you were on the the letter in science, which was encouraging people with, with Alina Chan actually um, to that we need to look into the issue uh, seriously. Yeah, and in fact, um, I proposed that letter um, and it is correct to say that um, relatively speaking, uh, my views have changed pretty dramatically uh, uh, away from thinking that that was a, uh, a plausible scenario to thinking that it's, um, you know, while, while still possible, not really plausible uh, at this point with the evidence that we have. But I should say also, um, and some of the reporting has, has kind of um, garbled this, that I never thought that that scenario was more likely than a natural, well, a, a zoonotic origin. Uh, I always thought it was a long shot, but a long shot worth taking seriously. Mm. That, yeah, I, I just, I just but given that, you know, that you all collectively often portrayed as, you know, being unwilling to, to discuss the topic, it, it would be unusual that you would write a letter saying that we should discuss the topic if that was your goal. But um, anyway, uh, Christian, uh, how about your background? Yeah, so my background is a little different. Um, I actually trained as an immunologist, but has spent the last 10, 15 years or so studying infectious diseases, trying to understand the emergence of infectious diseases, understanding the evolution and understanding the spread. And much of that work has been focused on work we've done in West Africa with a focus on Ebola and Lhasa in particular. And then with the emergence of Zika in the Americas, that became a big focus of ours to understand the emergence of of Zika, both in the Americas, but also importantly uh, here in the United States. And I actually, you know, the reason why I changed into infectious diseases and more so of a global health focus was that I was actually reading Eddie's books and papers and Mike's papers on virus evolution and thought that it was really interesting and thought that that was something I wanted to do for my postdoc and for the rest of my career. And that sort of got me on to, to studying the viruses, again, understanding where they're coming from and how are they evolving and, and, and how does they spread around. And I obviously, with, with the emergence of, of SARS-CoV-2 and the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, became very interested in, in the question of where, where did this come from? And again, we have the two hypotheses, which we will talk about today. And I will say, I thought in the beginning that there was too quick dismissal of the, the lab, lab leak specifically, because there is a reason why in particular for this particular pandemic, it's really important to consider. And that's why I reached out to Eddie and Eddie and I sort of got this process started. I think from, from my perspective, having done this type of work in the lab during my PhD, for example, understood a lot about the biology going on at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And then, of course, with Eddie's much uh, bigger expertise on, on just viral revolution of, of an emergence um, to get to get those questions started. I, th- I just have one quick follow up for all of you. So um, the coronaviruses in particular, was this an area that you've all published on, you know, the uh, COVID, obviously, but also COVID origins now. But were coronaviruses something that you were working with in advance of the pandemic? Or did you like switch the focus afterwards? Yeah, maybe I can answer that first, because the answer to that is no. I I obviously knew about coronaviruses and, and, you know, looked at SARS-1 and others. But generally speaking, no, not published anything on coronaviruses and by no means a coronavirus uh, expert at the time of the start of the pandemic. Of course, what I was an expert on is understanding emergence of viruses and importantly, very diverse viruses like Lhasa, Ebola and Zika, for example, are very different viruses. But from my perspective... No, no expertise and, and, and experience with coronavirus prior, prior to the pandemic. 
Similar, uh, similar for me. No, no publications on coronaviruses before the uh, pandemic. I had a few, um, not a huge number, but I, I had published one paper on coronaviruses in China. In fact, sorry, back coronaviruses in China. So I had, I had some background in that. But my, like Mike and Christian, my, my, my background is in broad viral emergence. But we're a little bit on coronaviruses. Hmm. I, I should add, though, that to talking about our first paper on this proximal origin is that both Andrew and Bob Gary, so Andrew Rembo and Bob Gary, did both have, have pretty significant expertise with, with coronaviruses. For example, Andrew Rambo has has kind of delineated the emergence of MERS and how that repeatedly spillovers from from bats, um, oh, sorry, from camels, and, and Andrew has done some of that 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 work on that. So certainly Andrew and and and, and Eddie and Bob had had much more experience than, for example, I had an experience. Yeah, I, I was involved in the MERS work as well, which I've for, forgotten right. about. Yeah. <laughs> I forget a lot of these things. <laughs> word, Eddie. <laughs> play that, honestly, for sure. Uh, that's great. So, like, a, uh, I suppose it's fair to say, so your your research networks and collaborations, um, and you know, have, have been um, included um, specialists in coronaviruses, yeah. Um, okay, that's great. So starting off, what we might do is just pose to you guys some of the um, uh, arguments that, that we've heard floating around the discourse, um, which I, th I think sound reasonably plausible to, to um, dummies like us, uh, lay people in general. Um, so I'll go first and start with the geography issue. So um, the, the first argument that we tend to hear in favor of a lab leak origin, it really starts with pointing to something that intuitively everyone gets, which is, it seems like a coincidence that, the, uh, this, that this virus emerged in the same city as the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, it's been claimed that the WIV was actively gathering and manipulating similar viruses. Um, and also that that particular area is nowhere close to known hotspots for the naturally occurring virus. So putting those two pieces of together, the, the, the claim follows that they, um, the claim is that the WIV should therefore be treated as the most obvious or prime candidate for the virus origin because the natural origins in that location are kind of implausible, according to the argument, and the WV is there and is one of the very few laboratories that specialize in this kind of virus? Can, maybe I can start because it, it's the wrong question to ask, right? The question you really have to ask yourself is the why Wuhan? Uh, is, it, is it so surprising that Wuhan itself became a epicenter of a pandemic? And I think the answer to that is that if you look at Wuhan, is it's the biggest, biggest city in central China, right? It's a very connected city, one of the most connected cities in China. Um, if we look at SARS-1, for example, we know that SARS-1 was found on farms just outside Wuhan in Hubei province and elsewhere. Um, so from that perspective is that it's not actually, you know, while Wuhan might not be on the top of that list, it's certainly in, in top 10 probably of, of risks of, of cities in China that, you know, where the next pandemic could start. And of course, pandemics start somewhere. Then you can additionally ask yourself the question, what are the likelihoods of having a lab studying coronaviruses in that same city? And again, there are many, many labs that study coronaviruses, certainly across Southeast Asia, because <laughs> there's a lot of coronaviruses there. So from that perspective, I think it's, it's not so unusual. But the Wuhan Institute of Virology is special for a few different re reasons. First of all, it's the only BSL-4 lab in China. But that's irrelevant to the conversations here because coronaviruses are not manipulated in BSL-4 labs. So that's totally irrelevant. So, but they Christine, were just, studying. Yeah. Just before you move on there, for anybody who doesn't know, BSL-4 uh, refers to biosafety level Yeah, four, sorry. Right? So they, yeah, so these are the biosafety levels. They go from one to four, where four is the highest and four is where we handle other viruses that we study, like Ebola and Lassa, for example, are handled in BSL-4, but there's very few viruses in general that is, that is studied at BSL-4. When we talk about the coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2 here, is that most tissue culture work with these kinds of bat coronaviruses will be done in BSL-2, where a lot of sort of just general 
you know, uh, general lab work is being done. Some people have compared this to a dentist's office, which is just outright untrue. Um, these are good containment labs, but they're BSL too, so it's still relatively low. Things like animal work, where you might grow viruses at rather higher titers, so you have more virus around, you're dealing with animals. This is typically done in BSL-3, um, which is sort of the, the la level at which a lot of work today is, is being done with, with, with SARS-CoV-2, right? I think most, most countries will have BSL-3 for, for SARS-CoV-2. So again, Wuhan Institute of Virology is a BSL-4 lab, but they have a BSL-4 lab, but they also have all the other levels, one to four. Um, and again, coronaviruses are not manipulated in BSL-4, so that's, that's entirely um, irrelevant. And so uh, I'll follow on from there. And <clears throat> the first thing I would like to say is for, for any listeners out there, um, I don't think anyone should be criticized for wondering about the possible coincidence between the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the origin of this virus. It's a perfectly natural thing to think. All three of us considered it. We, we all came to conclusions at different time points. Um, for me, um, some of my own research and research uh, in collaboration with uh, Joel Wertheim and uh, Jonathan Picar at UCSD um, who, who, who led this work. Um, so, so, so that for me, there were a couple of crucial th things that really reframed my view uh, of, of this supposed crazy coincidence. The first is, um, that this virus was going to emerge in a big city, that if you drop a virus with the transmission properties of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 circa late 2019 into a rural part of China, 99% of the time, it's not going to establish itself. It really requires being put in the middle of a big city where there's lots of people um, uh, closely connected for this to take hold. So really, the question should be, what are the chances that, you know, one of the top 10 cities in China has a coronavirus lab or, you know, a virus that studies bat labs or emerging viruses. And this is something I've been looking into just over the last uh, few days in more detail. Um, and eight out of the 10 uh, top 10 cities, plus Hong Kong on the periphery, uh, you know, not in mainland China, uh, have labs that you could, after the fact, point to and say, this is a crazy coincidence. So if this virus had emerged in Beijing, there are four labs in Beijing that you could point to and say, what a crazy coincidence, including one that has ties to EcoHealth Alliance, uh, sampled uh, uh, at the, the Mojang mine that some readers will be familiar with that was in the early days, part of the, before the goalposts shifted, you know, part of the, the lab leak uh, uh, narrative. Um, and so, you know, while it starts at a reasonable place, when you look at it uh, with the evidence that's accumulated, um, it actually is not such a strange thing. The strange thing turns out to be uh, that this virus uh, is so connected to a wildlife market in the middle of, that, of Wuhan. Mm. Yeah, and that's the, that to me is, is, but see, when I see this outbreak, what I see is not Wuhan. I see live animal market. And that's exactly what happened in SARS-1. And you had, to put, you had to pick any place in Wuhan for it to emerge. It, if it was a zoonotic, it would be the live animal market. And lo and behold, it emerged in the live animal market. I mean, it's, that to me would be an even bigger coincidence. I mean, it's, to me, it's extraordinarily positive, powerful observation. Then you ask yourself, what's the, what's the odds if the virus was in fact from a lab? What are the probability that then it first appears in a live animal market 30k away? And I would suggest to you that probability is, is infinitesantly small. Okay. And it's, I've, I've actually, I wonder if you've actually been to Wuhan and I've been to this live animal market, you know, and it's not a particularly busy place. It's, it's not a hub, not a massive humanity. There are far busier places in Wuhan. So why there? And the reason why is because, like SARS 1, that market was selling particular wildlife species that we know are reservoirs for the virus okay and that to me is what what i'm absolutely drawn to every single time the other thing to say about wuhan is although it's 
as Christian said, it's it's one of the biggest cities in 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 China. Um, it's it ends very abruptly, and then you are into the wild. You, you are in the wild. It's really quite extraordinary. And around Wuhan, it's very agricultural, and a variety of other viruses have emerged in the in the Wuhan area. It's not a great kind of sprawl. It's not like say you know Tokyo can sprawls on and on and on and on. It's very distinct city, and then then nature and wildlife. And so it's a wetland area. So there's lots of kind of you know um, rivers and, and and lakes around there. And so you can imagine, it's, you know, it's not hard to imagine that 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 those those areas carry viruses, and I should also say that again, when the when the great arguments is, most of these viruses come from these bat kind of viruses come from Yunnan province, which is in the southwestern China. In Hubei, we know there are bats that carry Corona um, SARS-like coronaviruses, and there are some bats that they have a recombinant virus. It's kind of like a hybrid a chimera virus, and some of the genes in those hybrid viruses from bats in Hubei are SARS-CoV-2-like. Okay, so the idea that this is an island away from anywhere where the hub of the virus is is just completely untrue. It's just absolutely not true, and we've us we we the bats have been have been sampled a fair bit in China, but there's a huge sampling and ascertainment bias towards bats from Yunnan province. That happens to be a really good place to go and sample bats. But if you, but there are bats, these um, rhinolophus bats, these horseshoe bats, are all over China, including around Wuhan. Okay, again, you don't hear that, but that is actually the case. That's, and and uh, sorry, if I could just follow up with one other thing you touched on, um, you know, let's let's just assume that the closest bat relative of these viruses came from Yunnan, and actually some some not yet peer reviewed work, but work that we've shared on virological dot uh, org um, shows that of the no, the the, the non recombinant so of of one of these fragments of the SARS CoV two genome um, that uh, <clears throat> doesn't have a a sort of chimeric history of its own. Um, uh, there, there, there's a, a a piece that's you know only a few years um, separate separated from bat viruses from Yunnan. It's actually uh, the, the Yunnan the Yunnan bat viruses are the closest relative, uh, even closer than these banal viruses that were discovered in Laos. Um, and and what. Uh, if you just look at a map of China and you look at Yunnan in the south, and then uh, uh, Guangdong, where SARS-CoV-1 emerged, versus Hubei, where SARS-CoV-2 emerged, the distance between Yunnan, which was um, yeah, the, the the closest bat virus for SARS-1 was in Yunnan, the distance between Yunnan and Guangdong is almost identical to uh, Yunnan and uh, and Hubei. And so I actually find it hard to believe that people who are uh, persistently making this argument that there's something just inexplicable about how far uh, the closest known bat viruses are from Hubei uh, uh, are acting in, in good faith. They're either deeply ignorant or acting in bad faith. Mm. Thanks. I think, um, Eddie, you're uh, you must be in some sense like a conspiracy theorist's dream because there's, I believe you had some photos of the market in question uh, that people have used as evidence and involved in publishing the the like early uh, sequence of the virus. And so you specifically um, must, you know, because of doing work in China, um, be the kind of nice lynch node that can be added into most conspiracies. Yeah, no, it's been, it's, it's been argued, in fact, that I actually took, I, I, those photographs were kind of faked some years ago, so that in the future, they could be used to point to the market. You know, this is the level that it's, it's, it's got to. But the reality is, right, the reason why I went to that market is because the local public health authorities knew this was an area where diseases might emerge, right? That's why we went there. And the reason why I uh, and Christian and people like Andrew and Mike are so, are so involved in this and all these papers is because that's what we do for a living, right? Amazingly, and that's why we get grant money to work on it because we work in the area, not because we're paid off by Tony Fauci. You know, this is this is this is the this is this is the problem. So, you know, I have. I you know I work with 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 
virologists in China on emerging viruses. So by definition, I'm going to be involved when there are outbreaks in China. And I, and I went to that market and I took, I took some photographs of, of, of you know, this, this, um, this, this live animal market. Um, and they've proven to be, to be of great interest. And I should say, I mean, you may know the story, but when, um, when the, the WHO team first went to Wuhan in, in February 2021, um, I sent them the photographs uh, that I took. And, and the Chinese delegation claimed that I'd faked them at the time because they didn't want it to be seen that that they were set that this this is this markets were selling wildlife when um when uh, the australian prime minister scott morrison matt one of the story very well so in, in one actually one month after pox origin paper he asked for an inquiry into covid origins what so it's like this right back right think start chris he said that what pox origins paper has prevented people discussing the the, you know, the the lab theory. I mean, it's complete nonsense, right? So Morrison, our prime minister, asked one month, Feb, April twenty twenty, for an inquiry into COVID origins. Um, in response to that, the Chinese consulate in Sydney said there are no live animal markets in China, right? <laughs> Even though I taken, I've been there, I taken photographs, <laughs> and I given it to. The, so there, there, there's so much misinformation going around, and I understand it for people who are not versed in this. It is complex to get this to get this understand what's going on right what do you actually believe you know but yeah so it's it's no surprise that i was there and it's no surprise that i took photographs there quite frankly yeah yeah no, i think really just, just one one thing to add there because it's really important to understand that the you know the virology field the the part of the virology field that i study emerging emerging viruses and study the evolution of these viruses right is, is a very small field it's it's not a huge number of people doing this type of work, and Peter Daszak and Eco Health Alliance, for example, is a, is, a, is another actor in this, right? But they have studied this for many years, and that's where why our names keep coming up again <laughs> because it's the same people who have been doing this for for decades, right? And the the problem is that people see these coincidences. One of the new ones is the Ebola lab leak, which also is being blamed on us because we have been studying Ebola in Kenema and Sierra Leone and lo and behold, Ebola emerged just a few miles from there in 2014, right? Obviously across the border in Guinea, but it's maybe a hundred miles or so away. And people then put that together and say, oh, so that Ebola must have been a lab leak too. And it was Robert Gary and Christian Anderson again. And the reason why these names keep coming up and the reason why we get grant money to study infectious diseases is because we study infectious diseases and have done so for many, many decades. And that's why the names keep coming up again, right? It's not because there's some major conspiracy theory here where all of us have been sort of fiddling with the fields well prior to the pandemic, right? It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. I don't even understand how you can make that connection. It, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Mm. Right. But that's really helpful. Uh, I think the, the, co the common thing with all of these things is a confusion of cause and effect, right, and misinterpreting associations. Um, so you guys have explained there were, there were two key claims that related to this coincidence of the WIV uh, and uh, Wuhan. And, um, uh, the, you know, you guys have explained that, these types of coronaviruses and the animals that carry them uh, are not unknown in those areas, that major uh, outbreaks occur not in some isolated hamlet somewhere, but almost by definition need to happen in a, a, a relatively major population centre. Um, th these um, labs that study viruses, uh, uh, you know, there, there, there are many of them, you explained, and that, you know, that they're probably going to be located in countries and regions where... The, um, these viruses are of concern. So um, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, so thank you for that. I'll hand over to Chris yeah. for the next question. So there's a bunch of related questions, that, but I, I guess to stay on the issue of the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, to get that out of the way first. Um, so uh, one of the points that you have touched on is uh, closely related uh, viruses, right? P potentially related viruses or whether they're ancestral or not, maybe you can help explain. But it's it's been claimed that another feature about the Wuhan Institute, which makes it particularly 
unusual, right, or suspicious is the position, uh, the possession of the RATG thirteen, um, along with I Matt Ridley summarized nine other close relatives, um, similar viruses, <laughs> and eight, 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 eight actually, eight, but who's counting? So, uh, yeah, the, you can correct any of this afterwards. And there's also the claim made uh, that there was a database, an online database of viruses uh, that was taken down, used to be freely available, and then was removed. And this has been not put back online. The World Health Organization has not been provided um, access to it when it went over. Uh, so it's basically implied that the possession of related viruses make the lab an obvious candidate. And the related suggestion is if this deleted database was provided, it could exonerate the Wuhan Institute. And the fact that they won't do that and have referenced um, hacking means that uh, it, we should be suspicious about what's going on. So how about uh, that <laughs> line of argument? I, I can start with a little personal history here that I can't remember if I've talked about this publicly. Um, and it was a, a good exercise in me um, for thinking about my own treatment of um, Shi Zhengli in particular and Chinese scientists who um, have been uh, blamed for um, the pandemic uh, in general. So um the, you 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 mentioned these other viruses that that Shi Zhengli's lab had possession of and in fact indeed there were eight other SARS related viruses that were collected by Shi Zhengli's lab in this so-called uh, uh Mojang mine a, a a mine in Mojang uh county in Yunnan province in southern China where RATG13, which early on was the closest known relative to SARS-CoV-2, uh, was also sampled. Um, and uh, and this, the, these um, genomes, the genome sequences were referred to in an addendum to uh, the article, Shi Zhengli's article about RATG13 in, in Nature. Um, and so after the letter to science came out, um, I was kind of a sort of toying with uh, the conspiracy theory that Shi Zhengli was actually hiding these other ones because one of them actually was basically identical to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and so I got in contact with Nature uh, and said, listen, you know, these, these geno the, the genome sequences are mentioned in the addendum, you know, it's not part of the main paper. But it's you know pretty clear that nature's policy is that if things are talked about in in the journal, they have to be made public. So could you please get in touch with uh, Zhang Lishe uh, and ask that those sequences be shared? Uh, and sure enough, nature was good enough to do that. And within like two days, maybe three days tops, um, uh, Zheng Li had shared the accession numbers of those with nature who shared them with me. And for like 16 hours, when I was out at my cabin on the west coast of Vancouver Island, I was, I think, the only other person in the world who had access to these ge genome sequences. And they weren't the smoking gun. They were, uh, all of these were uh, quite distantly related, much more distantly related to SARS-CoV-2 than RATG-13. Are they SARS-CoV-1 like, Mike? Um, they were, no, they are still SARS-CoV-2 like, unless I'm forgetting yeah. something, but quite way further away than yeah. RATG-13. And, and, and RATG, that ends up being RATG-15, right, Mike? Okay. Yeah. Say again? Aren't these the ones that then end up being called RATG-13? Uh, sorry, RATG-15? Uh, I don't know about that nomenclature system, but at any rate, like two days after, or like 16 hours after I had them, uh, uh, Zheng Li Shi put out a preprint basically saying the same thing that I had seen, which were, they're not actually very interesting at all, and certainly not the uh, 
the smoking gun. And so I was then faced with this, okay, what have, what have I engaged in here? I've engaged in kind of entertaining the thought that she was basically lying. Um, and that kind of chastened me and, uh, um, and made me realize that that letter that I published in science that in a very uncritical way, just sort of bought into the idea that um, maybe there was a big cover up and conspiracy um, was pretty naive, which uh, a good friend of mine uh, one time told me might be the case. <laughs> My, uh, Michael, can I just ask a follow up like for a layman there? So yeah, he, he, why would it be the case that, you know, the sequences that she sent you that I think people would say, well, but you know, if she wanted to hide the sequences that she had, she could just mock up uh, non-existent ones or something like that. Or mm -hmm. she has other ones that, uh, you know, is not providing. So why is it that you have confidence, you know, that these are what they say they are and everything that they had? Yeah, well, first of all, Eddie uh, has some g good information uh, where you would need a time machine to travel back and, and organize this cover up. Um, but I'll say two things. First of all, now when I th think about it, everything that Zhang Lishu has said um, has actually been backed up um, uh, by other evidence. There's nothing that she said anywhere along the way where there's any uh, evidence that she's been lying, dishonest, covering anything up uh, uh, or, or anything else. Um, and, uh, and then second, yeah, I would hand it over to Eddie to talk about um, <coughs> why there's very good reason and reason importantly that the DOE, the FBI, uh, the the intelligence community hasn't been privy to in making and their assessments on how this pandemic started. So this relates to the the Twitter thread that Chris has already mentioned that I posted yesterday. And what this is about, and I mentioned this story before. It's a, about um, a paper, an an unpublished paper from 2018. And very briefly, this, it's my first record on that lands it, but very briefly, I had a postdoc called Jay Cure, who was with me for a while. Um, and then he went to the Wuhan Institute of Virology for a few years and now he's in Shanghai. And while he was at Wuhan Institute of Virology, he did some work on, on bat coronaviruses. And he was interested in the evolution of, of these bat coronaviruses. He was interested to find out where SARS-1 came from, okay? And the, and the idea they were interested in was, did SARS-1 come from, it was found in Guangdong originally, did it come from Yunnan? Right, which is kind of like what everyone's asking now. That was their idea. So what they did was they went to their, their database of, of viruses and they got some sequences. And um, some of those sequences are from RATG13. And they, they, they would have liked to have got whole genome sequences. But in fact, that was actually pretty hard to do. So they ended up getting just individual genes for some of these viruses. And this RATG13, the closest one from, from the Wuhan lab, they got the complete kind of polymerase gene for that, and they did some analysis, and we and um, that paper was submitted to a number of journals in in um, in 2018, three journals, and they rejected it. Right? They just didn't think it was very interesting. Yeah, I think they regret that now, right? But anyway, so it was it, it was just rejected, and the reviewers said, okay, it's kind of cool, but it was just an evolutionary story. But we we want whole genomes. That's what they wanted, and and they couldn't do it because it was just too hard. So eventually, the paper was was pulled. Um, in October 2018, because they couldn't get whole genomes. And then what happened was, um, then we we just forgot about it. I forgot about it. Jay forgot about it. The first author forgot about it completely. When they submitted the paper um, in 2018, though, they, they sent the sequences to GenBank, and they put like an arbitrary four-year embargo on release of the sequences. You, when, when you submit, you often put an embargo saying, because then when, when the paper's published, you relax that embargo and the sequences go up. But they put a four-year one, an arbitrary four-year date. So in July 2022, these sequences appear suddenly on GenBank, these back coronavirus sequences that were in virology, with my name on the on the submission form so suddenly again there he is he's <laughs> everywhere right coming it from must, the past <laughs> it must be him coming from the past right and i honestly i thought 
I opened, I thought, what is this? When I first saw it, I thought, Genbank must just have got this wrong. Why am I on this? And then I went back and I found my records. And I actually was on this paper. And I found the paper. And I've gone, I've given all the documents in the paper, all the emails, a variety of people to look at. And what it shows, so the great thing is, it really is the time machine. It's what they were doing in 2018, before the pandemic. At which point, of course, there was no need to hide anything, right? And that, you know, they, could, they could just submit what they were working on. You know, and lo and behold, is SARS-CoV-2 in there? No. Is there a close rate of progenitor virus in there? No. Is there RITG13? Yes, but only one gene. Okay. And that backs up what Zheng Li Shi has said. And it and it's you know, it shows you very, very clearly this is what they had and what they were working on. And the virus is just not there. Now, if, if they'd have found, if we'd have found our you know, SARS-CoV-2 or very close relative in that data set, it's game over, right? That would be that would be high confidence evidence. It comes from that lab. But it's simply not there. It's and this is like an independent analysis. It's what the FBI want to do, and I kind of did it inadvertently because my memory is really bad and I forgot about the paper, and there it actually is, right? So, you know, and then it, that fits her story. It fits that they had trouble sequencing. They got it a bit, I think they got it, in, they finished it in 2019, that particular virus. They got more sequences. But there's there's just nothing else. This whole Mojang mine, there's no more sequences. You know, that database you refer to, that went on and offline over a variety of, of months and weeks. Like, it's not a simple story. They took it down. That was it. It went went on and offline. So it's actually much more complicated than people than people say. So look, if you can put that virus in that lab, I would happily believe a lab leak. I absolutely would. I absolutely would. But since the three years this has been going on, there's been PH analysis of PhD theses, emails, social media, unpublished papers, and there's nothing. Absolutely, absolutely. nothing. And you are you telling me that in all those all that time, these scientists didn't say tell anybody anything or write anything down about the work they were doing that created this forest? Not a single thing ever. L yeah. Long before they had any reason to hide. Yeah. Their... yeah. Yeah, at the same time, they forgot that their sequences were going to get released in Gen Bank in four <laughs> years' time, right? So these master criminals made this <laughs> elementary mistake of forgetting that, yet covered it up so perfectly. I mean, no, it's it's if you think about it for rationally for a few seconds, it's it's just nonsense, right? It's there should be a there should be a trace somewhere. Someone should have said something, emails or messes something. Yeah. There should be something there, but yeah. it's not. Yeah, Maybe. I get you. So it, it, sorry, sorry, Chris, but I just want to emphasize, like, what you're saying is in this counterfactual universe where where um, COVID, uh, you know, escaped from this lab, in then they did not know that that was going to happen back in 2018, 2019, all the way up. There was no reason to operate in secrecy. There was no reason. Although I bet you absolutely, I can guarantee, Matt, someone would have proposed that they were actually doing it in secret, you know, longer. That they, I mean, I've I've actually written down fourteen different variants of the lab leak theory. Okay, yeah. and you, you can you can choose any one uh, you want. RATG yeah. is real, it's fake. So someone will, at some point would have proposed, oh, they were doing it in secret for years and I've years. Got, That's definitely oh, out. There. Oh, absurd! Oh, I believe it. we we look at conspiracy theories um, a lot on this show, and um, that there is an explanation for everything. Of course, everything, yeah. But uh, no, no. I'm, I'm just addressing the normal people um, in this. <laughs> yeah. but, so but I, I think I, just, just a few, because I, I think that a few things that are important here, right? If we talk about this RTG 15 and to the question of have the Wuhan Institute of Virology, do we know of all the viruses that were ever sequenced? And I think the answer to that almost certainly is no, we don't, right? But what's really important here is that if you look at RITG15, I, I think these eight viruses we're referring to, I believe those are RITG15, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I looked it up, you, and you're right. One of them is RITG15, and uh, and it's they're actually high, almost um, identical genomes, right? They're is not that, sars cov I think, I think are they the lineage? Sorry, are they the lineage four viruses in that paper that I? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that all fits. It all fits absolutely perfectly. Oh yeah. Right. But, but, but but what what's important here, right, is that the reason why people knew that the Wuhan Institute of Virology had sequences of these sequences, not the actual virus, right? It's not an isolate. It's just the sequence of the virus. The reason why people got so obsessed with that is that it was mentioned in church paper. 
and she had given talks where she had phylogenetic trees showing that, oh, there's, there's these viruses that you haven't actually seen that are out there. The problem is that if you look at that slide that she has given, first of all, she's presenting the data saying, look, we have these other viruses. She's not <laughs> trying to hide it, right? But if you look at those slides and you actually know what you're looking at, you can very clearly see that those viruses are not SARS-2, right? Not even close. They are somewhat closely related to SARS-2, but there's absolutely no way that they could be SARS-2. Hence, the question of what are those particular viruses and what are they hiding is totally irrelevant because it's not SARS-2, right? So then the reason why they're quote-unquote hiding it when I got this question is that, well, it's probably because they're waiting to publish a paper on it. Maybe they're writing the paper right now, right? And then, lo and behold, the paper comes out and everybody can see, oh, yeah, they're not actually related to SARS-2, so let's move on to the next and move the goalpost again. And to me, it's such a perfect litmus test that if you're sort of, you're in your frame of mind is that they're hiding everything, and then they show you the evidence, and it's really trivial and it's completely unrelated, you just move the, the goalpost and say, look, whatever else are they hiding? And yeah. Since Alina Chan, for example, is, is, is one of the ones you're focusing on for this particular one, the perfect example of this too from her was that all my emails with Tony Fauci was released out in the public domain, right? And you can see all the emails there. You can see the correspondence about, you know, after this famous February 1 conference call. And what you can see is just scientists talking about science. Alina's question to this is that, oh, but where are the emails where they talk about the cover? It's like, yeah, th those emails don't exist, right? Because there is no cover up here. But the problem with this sort of obsession with like they're hiding, they need to show everything. As soon as you show them these things, the goalpost just moves to the next thing and saying, oh, but there must be something over here that they're hiding, right? And it never ends. It absolutely never ends because you can't prove a negative, right? It's, it's, it's impossible. And I think these RHEG15 and this whole, you know, farce around these eight missing genomes, right, is such a perfect example on that. There's simply nothing for them to hide there. And they were just writing a paper and then they published it and then you have all the sequences. And lo and behold, unrelated to SARS-2. And, and our colleague, uh, Flo Debar, who's uh, the most uh, knowledgeable and authoritative person in France uh, on the origins of, of COVID-19, uh, actually uh, dug up r recently um, uh, evidence that uh, Zheng Lishe had posted those uh, sequences in March uh, of 2021, long before I got in touch with nature. And she, she only released them uh, uh, later on in the summer. But they were already uh, submitted, and, and I'm sure that her preprint was basically done but before I coincidentally got in touch right around that same time. So I I think I can a little bit devil's advocate for you um the position of I think people that would be uh would still so you've set the case out very well for why virologists for example think that it's very unlikely you'd have to be planning you'd have to have this kind of program which was, you know, hidden for years in advance and, and yet also be publishing various things which are closely related, um, seemingly without concern. But um, so China, I think everybody here would agree, is a fairly authoritarian regime, right? A single state country. And it has a history including in the COVID pandemic of censoring and suppressing information that reflects negatively on it. Um, I think some of you have argued that the Chinese authorities, although they have supplied certain information, they've also held stuff back, right? Uh, Metagenomic data for environmental sampling. And so how about that issue that like, so if, if this is correct, then that database, just for example, like the it is a a canard on the the lab leak side. So why wouldn't the Wuhan Institute just give it and you know kind of 
from their point of view, they often say that, you know, that is the thing that would allow them. Of course, it wouldn't, right? They, they would, like you're saying, Christian, just move on to the next thing. But um, if the information would support their case, why wouldn't they release it? I, I would strongly suggest they're not releasing it because they're not allowed to release it. OK, mm. and I think that's that's the key problem. And I think what you're seeing now, and I've heard this directly from from people who collaborate that with that lab, is that um, China clearly are, are um, pushing an, the idea that the virus is not from China in any way at all. OK, and there's definitely it's not China. And I think that's for domestic politics. I think that's I mean, Xi Jinping is basically doing a Let's make China great again kind of policy and wants to come across as a strong leader and China is not to blame for this. And I think that means that anything that can pin in any way the virus to China, and I don't, and I don't think a database does, I have to say, but anything that, that, that makes China look bad, they're not going to allow it out. And so I don't think that lab is allowed to allow it to give it. That's my strong, impre strong impression what's going on. So basically, Eddie, you're saying that China doesn't just willingly share everything we ask for. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean it, th this argument keeps coming up, right? And it is an absolutely ridiculous argument because, of course, China is obfuscating, right? But yeah. we got to, like, are they obfuscating because of a lab leak? No. no, none of this is special to a lab leak, right? I think, and what is really important here, too, is that we have to, China is not just China. Right. Yeah. When you're talking about this being a lab leak, you're not talking about the Chinese authorities. You're talking about Chinese scientists, yeah. human mm. beings, and you are accusing them specifically yeah. Yeah. at the moment, specifically of having created the virus and having covered it all up. It's a specific yeah. allegation. Right. It's not that well, but Chinese authorities and it's like, no, 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 no. You're being very specific here when you're talking about a lab leak. And that's one of the aspects of this, which I think, you know, I, I had a long conversation with Mike about this around the science letter, the Bloom it All science letter, because this is the part to me that we really have to be careful, right? That when you go out there and you make straight up allegations, when you now actually have evidence to inform what you think is the most likely scenarios here, is that you have to remember specifically what it is that you're doing. And very specifically, what you were saying is that Chinese scientists, Zhe Zhengli and others are lying out about yep. it. And yep. there's a major cover up around this, right? Yep. And we can never forget that that's what it is. It's not just like, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that, right? And the question itself, could it have come from the lab? is a very reasonable question to ask yourself, given, again, you have the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Early on in the pandemic, where we had very little data on what was going on here, asking yourself the question, could this have come from the lab, is a very legitimate question. The problem is, of course, that since then, we have gotten a lot of evidence. And we also have to remember, again, that for a virus to leak out of a lab, it has to be in that lab to begin with. And you don't just go out and randomly pick up the next pandemic virus, right? The pandemic viruses are very rare, hence we don't have pandemic all, pandemics all the time. Or the other version of this, which is that they created the virus specifically, in which the, 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 the cover-up is a lot larger, right? Is that those possibilities, a priori giving no evidence, are quite unlikely but not impossible but then you have all the evidence that point directly to that market in the middle of the city, right? And that's why you then have to saying like, oh, actually, I don't have any, any, any evidence that Zhu Shengli has been lying about this. I don't have any evidence whatsoever that this was in a lab prior to the pandemic. And let's not forget that it's not from a lack of trying to find evidence of that, including the example that Eddie gave that, oh, the <laughs> sequences went online that were from 2018, right? Is that... Wherever we look, every single time, if it's the emails, if it's the theses, if it's the intelligence community in the United States, if it's in databases, if it's in papers, whatever it is, right, that every time we come up negative for any evidence of that virus having been in the lab prior to the pandemic, 
that's the one side, right? And then on the other side, you can look at, but what about the cases? What about the hospitalizations? What about that market? And all, all of that just points straight to that market in the middle of Wuhan, right? That's true evidence. It's not the absence of evidence for that. Yeah. And I, I think we probably will move to that in just a second. That, um, so Christian, just to summarize for some of the people that might not be as much in the weeds, there was a letter early published um, in February 2020 in The Lancet, where a group of scholars, I think the important thing is the context that you just provided, right, that they are responding to allegations that they are seeing directed at scientists who they know. They are not, uh, I, the way that I read that letter, and I know various people have read it differently, was that it was expressing support uh, for scientists in the face of the, the kind of conspiratorial allegations at them. So that, that letter is sometimes presented as an attempt to shut down any research into the laboratory origins. And there is a, a paper which you are the uh, lead author on, which followed in, in Nature in March, the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2. And that looks at a range of evidence and is sometimes presented as like another effort to, to shut down the conversation. But for anybody can go and look at the, uh, the paper, it's quite short. And it's very clear in the conclusion you you lay out you know more scientific data could swing the balance of, of evidence to favor one hypothesis or, or another. So rather than completely settling it, you simply said this is the evidence that we have the date that that shows that. So I I think those are important. And then there is the the additional letter, uh, Michael, with the one that you suggested, which appears in Science, saying that uh, these there needs to be investigations at the origin. So there's a lot of letters and a lot of papers that people might not be familiar with. But uh, Matt, maybe the positive evidence for the uh, for why the lab leak is less likely would be able good to focus on. Yeah, yeah, I'll put that to you, gentlemen. Um, we might try to kill two bats with one stone <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'll hit you with them both at once. So so, so the, the, the first uh, argument that we've seen is, is kind of dismissing some of that evidence you mentioned about the infection uh, nucleus be, you know, being located on the um on the wet market um it's claimed that that's just an artifact of biased sampling that you know essentially all the sampling was done in the vicinity of the market because uh, the research is expected to be around the market and so if that's the only place you look then that's the only place you're going to find positive um data points the the second argument that's made is around the lack of mutation and this one is actually an interesting one because it's claimed that um uh, zoonotic viruses typically show fast mutations after making the leap to human hosts as they optimize for the novel conditions in the human body. Um, and since it's claimed that this was not observed for SARS-CoV-2, it's, it's suggested that it therefore follows that the virus must have been engineered and was therefore pre-adapted uh, before spreading in humans uh, in the wild. So... Um, who would like to go first with these? Two? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, For the I listeners can who can't see the, their faces, uh, I just say that everybody can start with the geographical, shaking their heads. <laughs> the geographical uh, uh, evidence and and the uh, the claims, um, mostly on Twitter, notably not in the peer reviewed scientific literature. Um, more than a year after our results were, were first made public um, that they are compromised by the, these sorts of, uh, of biases. Um, and so first thing, um, I actually spent many months um, producing a, 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 a perspective, a, pa a paper in science that predated the, uh, the actual statistical analyses that uh, Kristen and Eddie and I and, and many other co-authors uh, followed up with um, in, in, in science, looking at the question of what scientists call ascertainment bias, this issue of 
um, is the pattern that you're seeing a real pattern or is it really just because um, you know all of the cases that that you you're finding are are being found because that's the only place you're looking and so for me this was like a a central question um, that I spent months working on um, and and as scientists we're kind of supposed to try to falsify hypotheses um, so there was epidemiological evidence um, that a lot of the early cases were linked to this one market uh, with 1500 workers in a in a city of 12 million people you know something around half of the early cases and that's just a, a really remarkable fraction of early cases to be linked with with one workplace um, but one way I could see that this could just be completely misleading would be if that was actually just a result of um, possibly surveillance for new, new uh, mysterious pneumonia cases being focused on markets because that's where SARS-1 uh, cases uh, uh, were, were known to be linked to. And I was told this by a colleague who who has links to China. You know, don't worry, don't make anything about the fact that a bunch of the early cases were linked to the market. It's just because that's where the, the 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 pneumonia of unknown etiology program was was focused. Um, so that turns out to be totally not true. Uh, there was no prior observation uh, and surveillance of markets uh, selling live animals, uh, and you know, when you peel back uh, from, you know, the studies that were done after the time where there could have been ascertainment bias that leaked in um, because people were aware of the link to the Huanan market, you get back to these um, early reports um, in, in uh, newspapers where um, the, the, the pandemic, the outbreak was, was discovered by doctors. Uh, and a, in particular, Dr. Uh, Zhixian Zhang at the Hubei Provincial Hospital of Integrated um, Traditional Chinese and Western Medicine, Xinhua Hospital uh, for, for, for short. December 27th, um, she saw the CT scans of an elderly couple um, who had pneumonia and had tested negative for every known pathogen, uh, looked at them and, and said, boy, this looks a lot like SARS, which she dealt with 20 years before, uh, forced their son, who was feeling fine, to have a CT scan. He had lesions as well. Uh, and so right then and there, she thought to herself, probably a new SARS-like virus, probably human-to-human -human transmissible because it's gone through this whole family, and probably you can be asymptomatic and, and have this virus. Lessons that took the rest of the world, including uh, China as a whole, many, many weeks and months to, to really absorb, unfortunately. Uh, but none of these people were connected to the market. Um, and it was only in the uh, next two days when... Uh, she and other doctors at that hospital were on the lookout for people with similar signs and symptoms the ne that the next four people showed up and turned out to be workers at the market that that link was made. Uh, and so uh, it, it's clear that, you know, before anyone could have uh, been uh, finding a bunch of cases uh, because of a bias toward the market, there were already lots of, uh, you know, you know, more than half at this hospital, more than half at another uh, at another hospital. Uh, so then, Christian and I co-led this uh, uh, Huanan Market study with Eddie and Andrew and 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 lots of others, um, where we dissected the the residential locations which Chinese scientists had. Uh, had generated and were published in the WHO uh, China uh, report um, that was published in 2021. Uh, and again, you know, we, we had concerns about ascertainment bias affecting those results. But what we homed in on was, um, you know, forget about the cases that we knew were epidemiologically linked to the market. What about the the many cases who were asked, did you work there? Did you visit there? Did you have any contact with anyone 
uh, who, knowing no knowing contact with anyone who could have been connected to there. And all these people said no, no, and no to those questions. And yet they uh, were clustered even more strongly around uh, the market than cases that were epidemiologically linked to the market. Uh, and there are very few uh, explanations for why that could be other than the epidemic actually started at the market and started bleeding into the local uh, community uh, from that market. Uh, and explanations that have been, been uh, or criticisms that have been put forward um, uh, have, uh, are, are, are just actually not correct. That, that for example, there was um, uh, a, a, a bias um, uh, or, or, or there, there was either a bias or deliberately hidden data, uh, two things that, that you can read about widely. Uh, there's no evidence that either of those things are correct. And uh, how about the, uh, Michael, the lineage? So I think this is genetic evidence um, and maybe a little bit complex, but there's there's reference to two lineages being present and and that this is positive evidence against a a lab leak so what what do the lineages refer to and why is that taken as evidence against um a, a lab leak yeah slight, slightly complicated but absolutely crucial and and here um we published a a companion article uh, led by Jonathan Picar and Joel Wertheim, um, and uh, and co-led by by uh, Christian and and me and Mark Suchart, um, where um, so, so so there are these two early lineages of the virus, lineage A and lineage B, that differ at 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 two sites across their almost thirty thousand nucleotides. Uh, and to cut a long story short, uh, in, in that paper, uh, we show that there's almost 100% probability that these lineages had separate origins into humans in the peak R et al. paper. In the other paper on ge the, the geography, what we realized is we had, um, a fortunately, access to geographical information about um, the two earliest lineage A viruses. Lineage B was already well accepted to be at the market, but lineage A had not been shown to be connected to the market, either epidemiologically or geographically. Our paper showed that those two early lineage A cases were both near the market in a way that's statistically, uh, you know, virtually inexplicable by chance if they hadn't started from from there. Um, and then George Gao um, from the China CDC, right before we pr pulled the trigger on, on our preprint, published a paper uh, sh just demonstrating what we had come to the, uh, the conclusion of and, and showed that sure enough, Lineage A was at the market after all, which our geographical and genomic uh, analyses together had shown was virtually a lock. Uh, and, and this goes back to th this, uh, the, the unlikelihood, first of all, that you would have even one uh, lab leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology leave no trace in terms of epidemiology, in terms of people infected at, at, at uh, the WIV or around it, and make it to the Western section of, of the Huanan market, one of only four sites known to be selling these sorts of animals, and the, and the part of the market that sold the live uh, raccoon dogs and so, so forth. Um, but now you have to explain, uh, almost certainly, that this accident, these accidents, unprecedented in human history, happened twice over the course of a couple of weeks. And each time those people made a beeline 15 kilometers across town and actually of all the 10,000 other places they could have initiated the first chains of, uh, you know, the first noticed clusters of a new respiratory disease, both times it happened at the Huanan market. 
is it at all surprising that there would be so if i'm following correct it suggests that there were two uh like leaps of the virus uh two separate lineages so is it at two all two jumps you mean two jumps yeah so is that surprising that you would have the virus meet the jump twice in the same location or does that kind of thing happen um if the virus i guess is quite close to making that leap christian do you want to channel joel here yeah <laughs> yeah it's it, it, i mean it, so a few things here to do first to answer that specific question right is that it's it's basically like if, if you look at mount mount everest and here i am challenging joel wertheim um if you look at mount everest has always been there and then we started trying to climb it but but we couldn't right and we tried many times and we just couldn't climb it and then in one day two people did and then after that of course several people actually summoned everest right the reason here is that when we're talking about two lineages we're talking about two lineages that we see evidence of but likely there are many other spillovers that almost immediately die out that we never see you can also have multiple spillovers of exactly the same lineage because the virus does not actually mutate that fast, right? So it's possible that lineage A, for example, might have spilled over from a single animal, for example, into 10 different individuals. <laughs> Maybe only two of those individuals gave rise to other cases. And out of those, maybe only one of them did. Or maybe both of them did, but now the lineages are basically identical from that spillover, right? So you don't, you can't distinguish them. And what is really important here is that people are so obsessed with like, oh, but they're only different by two mutations, right? So that could have happened anywhere. Is the perfect litmus test for like, what does that data actually show? And why is it actually important that you know how to do these <laughs> kinds of analyses properly? And the reason for that is that if you look at lineage A and lineage B, yes, they only differ by two mutations. Lineage B is more prevalent than lineage A. Lineage A looks to be the quote unquote older lineage, yet we see evidence that it spills over later. So when we're looking at when does the spillover at A start versus when does the spillover at B start, it looks like B gets going first and then A later on despite the fact that A actually appears to be older than lineage B, right? And you have to take all of that evidence and saying like, well, now we, we look at these two mutations and we look at the cases and we look at the genomes and we look at what's actually going on with these two lineages. You should take all of that information and then you ask yourself the question, what best explain this, including, I should say too, that we don't see an intermediate between A and B in, in humans, right? is you take all of that evidence and then you, you, you sort of replay the tape and saying like, well, actually, what do we see with SARS-2 out in the population when these kinds of new transmission chains start is that the exact picture that we see early, early on at the Huanan seafood market with lineage A and lineage B is extremely, extremely rare that we see exactly that event in humans, right? And that's why, based on that paper, why it's not a proof and why it doesn't show it with 100% certainty that it's spelled over twice, if we look at the evidence, it just shows very strongly, yes, there is very strong evidence that it did, in fact, spill over twice. And importantly, both of those are associated with the Huanan seafood market. And Can I, think I just that... jump in with one thing yeah. that is pretty vexing here, which is... Um, some of our scientific colleagues who have uh, uh, pr pretty strong voices uh, in, in this debate um, keep going back to this argument, but, but no, you know, a single individual can have uh, two mutations accumulate within, you know, the, 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 the period of a single infection. And so the fact that there's two, two, two mutations separating lineage A and lineage B is just not unexpected at all. Well, first of all, we, we, we talk about in, in the paper uh, how we're well aware of this, and this is actually very much part of the simulations 
that we do. But the point is not that um, it's possible for some virus viruses in a single uh, the course of a single infection to accumulate two mutations. Uh, the 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 point is that it's not just that there are two mutations separating lineage A and lineage B. It's that lineage A and lineage B account for giant proportions of uh, the f- first, you know, 750 genome sequences that we sample in the pandemic, something like one third lineage A and, and two thirds lineage B. And each of them to go into the weeds has a giant polytomy um, at their root, where there's a sort of um, uh, root sequence of lineage A. And then from that sequence, it's clear that there are a whole bunch of um, mutation, genome sequences that are like one mutation away from that, but they're all a different mutation away. And same thing for lineage B. There's a whole bunch of lineage B uh, uh, genome sequences that are one mutation away from the lineage B root, but they're all a different mutation away. And it's that pattern, as we spell out in the paper, uh, that is deeply, deeply unlikely to observe observe unless uh, the virus jumped twice, not to mention the fact that lineage A has accumulated so few mutations um, compared to um, lineage B that it breaks the molecular clock. It's not consistent with lineage a lineage A-like ancestor being the single original source of the virus that then evolved into lineage B. So all of this is in the paper, and this is a sort of common theme in the criticism. Um, all, a lot of, almost all of the main talking points are addressed in the paper, but they're either, um, people are either unaware of them or they're aware of them, uh, but they're counting on their um, followers to not read the paper. I mean, also one important point here is that it's highly technical, right? I mean, being able yes, to yeah. do these, like, yeah. I mean, being able to do these analyses right is is not simple, right? That's where expertise and experience actually comes in. I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I fix stuff on my car, right? But I'm not going to go build a jumbo jet <laughs> tomorrow. And it's it's it it really is, you know, important that when you're sitting there, it's not just that there are two mutations, right? It's we have all these other observations that we say, let's put them into a meaningful framework in which we can test different hypotheses of what might explain the data. And that's exactly what the paper is. And necessarily it's technical. And it's all in there. If you actually understand what you're looking at, you should be able to interpret and saying like, yeah, okay, right? But most people just can't for the simple reason that, that, that you know, they just don't have the expertise. Yeah. I, I do think, like, Eddie, because you have another rejected paper, right, which actually becomes the perfect test of this lineage A, lineage B split too, and I think it would be worth mentioning that. Yeah, so this one I have not yet shared. I sent it to various people. Um, so this one is, this one was, again, rejected there's a lot of rejection of papers in 2021 um of and it was a paper looking at the early spread of the virus in Wuhan and the key thing is this was this was written long before the R2 R science papers okay so again it's like our time machines back in action and what they did was take these sequences from early from early Wuhan from patients sampled in January 2020 some infections were would have been inquired in December 2019, but sequence is January 2020, um, and they did analysis. And what you find is, lo and behold, there are two lineages, A and B, that are they, they have different names in that paper, but they have they are completely distinct with no intermediates. So again, we've gone back in time, tested the hypothesis, and there it is. It works. Okay. Um, interesting also that um, you, you mentioned the pre the pre-adaptation question. So very briefly on that, um, this this virus has evolved remarkably actually rapidly phenotypically over the last three years it's picked up numerous changes they're, they're the variants of concern that we've seen the first one is mutation called d614g that appears in wuhan it's in these early samples from january 2020 also pre-adaptation 
that's as much in the lab leak scenario as it is in the natural scenario. If you take RATG13 and you put in this famous furine cleavage site, these four amino acids that in the hinge, of, it's a spike protein, it's got like a little hinge, okay? And he put, the, he put the, that little cleavage site at that hinge. You don't get a pandemic virus, okay? You get RATG13 with a furine cleavage site in, okay? The reason why this worked is because they, the virus that got spreading happened to have exactly the right receptor binding domain the bit where the virus attaches to the host cell that gets it going. And that receptor binding domain is in nature. Okay, we found it in pangolins, we found it in these, these bat viruses from, from lab. So they would have had to have picked up by complete chance in this lab exactly the right virus with exactly the right receptor binding domain pre-adapted, then put in for an cleaver site for it to for have got going. So that's a pre-adaptation scenario. OK, and we know that sequences from nature. So I think that pre-adaptation argument just is just a non-starter, just absolutely a non-starter. Yeah, I think may maybe just add a little to this because this one keeps coming up. And I expect uh, Robert Redfield, our former CDC director, will give testimony on one Wednesday. And this is his favorite, favorite, you know, this pre-adaptation. But there's several questions you have to ask yourself. First of all, you have to understand that SARS-2 is a pandemic virus, right? So there's something special about it. If, yeah. if, if, if it wasn't special, it wouldn't be a pandemic, right? So the survivor bias here is enormous because in fact, it is the first pandemic of a highly severe SARS like coronaviruses that we know of, right? So from the get-go, SARS-2 is special. It had to have a good receptor binding domain that could recognize, you know, human ACE2 receptors. Maybe it had to have that furin cleavage site like a lot of other co common cold coronaviruses do, for example. Maybe it had to have all of these, but importantly, it had to have the be the full SARS-2 virus, right? It's not just, well, it's not just the RBD, the receptor binding domain, or the furin cleavage site, or the RBD with the furin cleavage site together. It's the whole virus, right? That's what creates a pandemic virus, which today we now know as SARS-2. And out in nature, these viruses try to spill over constantly, right? And many people end up getting infected with coronaviruses we have never heard of, but then they don't lead to onward transmissions, or maybe they lead to one or two, right? But then they die off and we never hear about them. This happens on a daily basis all over the world, right? Just to be clear, not just with coronaviruses. So, so Christian, that is uh, it's out. Yeah. Just to say, there's a paper published online the other day in from Myanmar making exactly that point, showing that SARS-CoV-2 like viruses, people are getting them all the time. Okay, there's twelve percent of people they surveyed were, were infected with the SARS-CoV-2 like virus, right? So that spiller process goes people on. People who worked uh, closely with yeah, bad exposures, like yeah, in, yeah, the wildlife, yeah, exactly, yeah. So people are exposed. Sorry, Christian. Yeah. So 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 again, like. The, these viruses try to become pandemics all the time, right? But very rarely does it happen. SARS-2 is, is that one virus, right? So it is special. That's, that's important. But it, again, it's the whole virus. So that's the first thing you need to understand. The next thing you then need to understand is that it's, it's especially adapted to humans. And the answer to that clearly is no, actually it isn't. And the reason why I'm saying that is we can see during the pandemic that this is capable of causing infections and epizootics in all kinds of other animals. White-tailed deer, they had a way bigger epidemic than we did here in the United States, for example, with most of them exposed. And then even at one time, 40% of them being positive for the virus. At the same time, are you kidding me? That is ginormous, right? Mink farms, we have heard about, of course. We have a zoo here in in San Diego, and we had tons of animals that have been infected, right? So this virus is not uniquely adapted, quote unquote, adapted to humans, right? It's just a generalist virus, which is capable of infecting a lot of different species. Now, what is important to add to that too, is during the pandemic, it's become much better at that whole human to human transmission, right? We have seen that with the emergence of variants of concern with alpha, del al alpha, delta, and, and now Omicron, right? So clearly there has a lot more potential. So that whole idea that it's sort of specific to human, 
and that it was pushed in that direction is disproven. This is not speculation, is disproven by the evidence we have obtained on this virus during the pandemic. But then you have the last aspect of this, which is that let's just say that it's special to humans, uh, or it's a generalist virus. Would anything in the lab cause it to be that passage in animals, for example, or passage in tissue culture? And the answer to that very clearly is no. Typically, when you do those things, you de-adapt for things like transmission, right? Because now it becomes adapted to an environment in a tissue culture, for example, which is very much unlike what it would experience out in the real world, right? So the whole argument, no matter how you look at it, no matter how you look at it, is disproven, right? And this is specific, this is special for when we're talking about the lab leak, because there's many things we can't disprove, as we have said in all our papers, right? We can find them highly unlikely, we can find them implausible, whatever you want to say, improbable, right? Use whatever word you, you want to use. But when it comes to this pre-adaptation hypothesis, it is disproven by the available evidence that we have. And it just doesn't make any sense that that would even link back to a lab, right? Because actually what would going on in the lab, you would assume that the opposite would happen. So and, I don't understand why this hypothesis that it's so special that it might have come out of a lab, <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense, right? It's so special because it's the pandemic virus, right? This is what it, pandemic viruses do. And, and this whole discussion, unfortunately, started with a misunderstanding about the first SARS virus. Um, and, and if you compare all of the SARS virus genomes that were, that were sequenced from humans from 2002 and 2003, um, they're pretty different. There's a lot of substitutions uh, that differ between them. Um, but what is sometimes not appreciated is that almost certainly those represent actually distinct cross-species transmissions. These are not uh, many, many, many substitutions that evolved after a single transmission into humans and then a long pre-adaptation stage before it became a more successful human virus. And so the whole idea is predicated on an elementary misunderstanding of viral emergence and evolution. So you guys have... You know, it would be quite difficult to summarize that that amount of evidence and you know that you've went through. But it, it's fair to say, I think, for anybody listening, that it's clear that this is not based on you know an unwillingness to consider different lines of evidence, but rather that there's a lot of positive evidence, gen genetic, <coughs> geographic, that points towards it. But um, Christian, one one thing that did come up for me and uh, maybe it was Eddie and Christian when they were, you were talking about it. So um, you did a good job of outlining why um, we have seen features similar in wild viruses and why the claims made about it being you know, uniquely pre-adapted don't hold up. But this whole focus around the foreign cleavage site Right. Um, and like you say, there's a survivorship uh, bias about this, this being the thing which reached the pandemic. So now it seems very notable, right, that, that this virus has this particular feature. Um, but, but two things. One is that people in the lab leak community point to the unfunded, diffuse proposal from EcoHealth, right, which in some component of it, has mentioned, uh, or at least is claimed to mention, of inserting furin cleavage site to coronaviruses. So uh, lab like proponents have argued, well, this is a smoking gun. This is the group associated with the Wuhan Institute. We're saying they're going to put this feature, which is unusual, into the specific virus that caused the pandemic. So how is this not a smoking gun and and related to that maybe is that um 
Christian, you in particular, you know, your emails are a constant source of fascination for the world, it, it <laughs> seems. But um, in, in various occasions, relevant experts did identify features in the virus that they initially thought made them suspicious that it could be engineered or there could be a passage in a lab. So the question I have is around that, so the diffuse proposal, why is that not the smoking gun that is claimed? And secondly, given all of the things that are described, why were there a significant amount of people that seemed uh, concerned about the possibility for it being an engineered um, yeah. virus? I mean, let, let's let's. So these are these are separate questions, right? Let, I mean, let's deal with diffuse first, because I think you know what's important is that first of all, what's described in diffuse is, is described by by Ralph Barrick at, at at you know University of North Carolina and describing work that that, that would be done there, right? And the important aspect of this is that that Ralph Barrick has papers showing that furin cleavage sites appear to be important to lowering host barrier. Now, so that was a prediction saying that, look, and we know this again from, from many of the common cold coronaviruses, for example, they have furin cleavage site. We know from highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses, for example, is the hallmark of them becoming highly pathogenic is that they have furin, gain furin cleavage sites, I should say. Um, and, you know, now you have a pandemic which is caused by a virus which also has a furin cleavage site. Well, it's probably because the reason why it has a fear in cleavage sites because we already knew that that's one of those risk factors that if you actually, if you are the next pandemic virus, chances are that you have a proteolytic cleavage site in the S1, S2, the, the, the part of the spike protein which gets cleaved, right? So it's no surprise that you have the experts talking about the importance of fear in cleavage sites. And then the fact that what they were talking about actually turns out to be true when we talk about SARS-2, right, is that that had a furin cleavage site too. But this comes back to my point that, look, it's not just the furin cleavage site that makes this a pandemic virus. The idea that it's a pandemic virus because of the fur furin cleavage site is ridiculous, right? It's a pandemic virus because it's it's SARS-2 and SARS-1 is different and that, that, that didn't become a pandemic. Although had we been slower back then and had let, given that some more runway, I'm actually not quite sure if it could have come because of all the evolution we've seen in SARS-2 and also saw in SARS-1 during that epidemic, right? So, you know, diffuse, I think it's an important consideration that we need to take into consideration as we're discussing this. But to me, it adds very little because, again, it's not even the relevant people, right? And they're talking about features which they're already predicted to be important for the emergence of viruses. And then we see a virus emerge and it has that feature. No surprise. Now, to your, to your other question around like, what is it with these features and why was it that people like myself talked about like, oh my God, it has these features and maybe it came from a lab, right? Is that it's really important that we distinguish between what did we know at the time of asking those questions versus what did we know just a few days later after tons of conversations with our colleagues versus new evidence coming in more analyses being done, all these different things, plus what do we know now today, right? This is not the same thing. In the beginning of the pandemic, very early on, we're talking about the first month of the pandemic here, is just saying you see a novel virus, it emerges, and it seems like it's spreading like wildfire, asking yourself the questions like, what's unique about this virus, because we haven't seen this before, is a very reasonable question to answer to ask, right? And then you add the additional again at Wuhan Institute of Virology and chimeric virus work there and bat sampling and things like that. You put all of that together, right? And it gives you this very early on in the absence of other any other evidence and ignorance on my part, because again, I was not a coronavirus specialist, right? Is that I looked at this and I said, you know what? I think we very seriously need to consider that the lab could be the, be the source of this particular virus. And then you start the scientific process, right? And that scientific process is me educating myself, 
tons of conversations among colleagues and saying, look, what does this really mean? What evidence do we actually have that we haven't considered yet? Are we looking at this correctly? Bringing in people like, you know, Christian Drostens and Ron Fouchier and, and Marion Koopsman, for example, that know a lot more about coronaviruses than we did, for example, where, of course, we learn from those, you know, conversations with colleagues. But there's also many other conversations with colleagues. I mean, you would be shocked to know that 99.999% of my conversations are secret and private, right? Because I don't publish them on the internet. I don't tweet about the, the conversations I have with my colleagues, right? Not because I'm hiding anything, but because that's what I do. I'm a scientist, right? And when we then separate those things out, where again, you ask that initial question, you look at what makes this special, some people like myself got spooked by this and said, we need to understand this better. I'm not willing to just dismiss this out of hand that this could have come from the lab because I think that's the wrong thing to do. And in fact, Chris, going back to you talked about the letters, the first you mentioned was the Lancet letter, for example, which did in fact dismiss the possibility, not fully dismiss the possibility, but use stronger language around this didn't come from the lab that I, I felt comfortable with at the time for the very simple reason that they hadn't actually looked at it, right? But then we look at it and then you change your mind. And then when you look at all the different hypotheses from bioweapon down to a you know accidental infection in a researcher in the field, right, is that you can start knocking the first ones off here pretty quickly and say, you know what? We look closer at that furin cleavage site. You're like, we have never seen that being used in labs before. Actually, it's not a great site. Actually, it's also out of frame. Like all of these things, which we didn't realize the first time we saw it, right? Comes that realization, some of which are pretty, pretty fast, right? And then additional layers like that receptor binding domain, for example, lo and behold, it was actually the exact, almost exact same one was found in, in, in pangolin coronaviruses, right? So that's clearly a natural feature. And that's just a stepwise process of scientific progress, right? Which you then do among colleagues. And of course, Eddie and I with Bob and, and Andrew had tons and tons and tons of conversations. And we are on many different time zones here, right? Eddie is in Australia. I am in San Diego. Bob Gary is in, at, at Tulane, New Orleans. And Andrew Rambo is, is in Edinburgh. And this means that that process never stops because some people are always awake, right? And that means that that early on, you can get a ton of stuff done very quickly. And your realization that, you know what? What we said in the beginning, it doesn't actually make sense when we look more closely at, at the evidence and we understand more of, of these coronaviruses out there. And that's what the emails show. They just show that ongoing dialogue. And what, what you're seeing in the GOP, and they've very blatantly chosen emails to, to support their particular narrative, they've not shown you all the other ones where, where I say, I think it's natural because of the, the pangolin virus. All those are not in there. So that's an, en that's an engineered narrative Okay, it's part of a ploy to 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 to. It's really really about taking down Tony Fauci, and we're kind of collateral damage in that. So that's a scandalous thing, and, that, and they're taking our emails completely deliberately, manipulating what we're saying by not showing you the full, the full discourse. Can I say one more thing about the Fern Cleaver site very briefly? And that's another thing that I've heard is that um, it's remarkable. People say that Zheng Ling Chi in her first Nature paper didn't mention the Fern Cleaver site, right? And somehow they try to cover it up by not mentioning it. So cover it up by submitting a paper to Nature and putting the genome sequence on a database. Now, just let me just tell you uh, briefly. So I was also on, on the, one of the first of the earliest papers, Nature paper on, on, on um, SARS-CoV-2, and we didn't see it either, right? And I'll tell you why we didn't see it and Zheng Lin Si didn't see it, is because everyone was in, in that first few weeks, they were in a race to write those papers, okay? As well as being, you know, at that, at very early on in January, the fact that it's, it, we didn't know it's, it, what it would turn out to be, we didn't know it'd be this pandemic, and people, human ego was dr drove a lot of this. People wanted to be on the first paper describing that virus. So, uh, Zhang Zhengzhang, George Gao, and Zheng Lingxi, and those papers were done very quickly. And you can bet your bottom dollar, a lot of postdocs and graduate students I know from our paper were doing the work, and it was done. Let's get this out as quick as possible. 
Okay, partly because we want to get the, you know, the the data out there, also because we want to be the first. And so those why not everything was mentioned. We didn't see it either, and I didn't know anything. I didn't even cross my mind until Christine told me about it later on. That, so the idea that you would you would actually then you're responsible for the outbreak, and you then you you publish one of the first papers and deliberately try and hide your involvement by putting the sequence online. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's, it's a ludicrous suggestion, completely ludicrous suggestion. So anyway, and I, th I think, again, you can, again, if you want, you can read all these things into it and say, ha-ha, they're doing that. But just, just think about, it's just about, it's the way scientists behave. And that's what you've seen all the way through this, this, these early weeks, what you saw was scientists scrambling to understand these data, right? We weren't told so by Tony Fauci. He didn't tell us what to think. He didn't tell us to write the paper. He didn't write the paper. We did it and we just wanted to understand the science. We thought it was important to get the message out there quickly and coherently. And that's what our paper is, right? And unfortunately, that's now being spun in a, in a, in a blatant attempt to drive a political message, right? And that's completely wrong. Hmm. Okay, so I guess very much related to the stuff you guys have been talking about is the claim that the uh, basically you guys and anyone else who is working in virology who is um, saying that it likely wasn't a lab leak that you have uh, you're essentially compromised that because you have an inherent strong conflict of interest because if it were to um, be commonly believed that uh, accepted that it was a lab leak then your careers your field generally in virology and uh your funding would be jeopardized so i'd like to <laughs> so this is so a why, very why unfair why did we raise in the first place then matt why if that was the <laughs> truth why did we then raise the possibility of lab leak in the first place hmm. next question no, no. yeah <laughs> I, I think no. I mean, I think it's it's a silly question, frankly, and I've, I've, unfortunately, oh, no, no, I'll tell you. If, listen, along. listen I, I'll absolutely guarantee this. If we had analysed those data and we'd have been convinced after the teleconference in our discussion, if we'd have been convinced that this was out of out of a lab, we'd have said so, right? The idea, the actually idea that we would have we were told to, um, or we thought it was a good idea to cover up because that jeopardised our funding is absolutely. Rubbish, and I and I actually strongly object to that. Okay, I don't. People can believe what I don't. I don't mind what people believe. They want to believe that lab. They're absolutely welcome to that. Where I draw the line is the accusation that we're involved in a cover up and somehow have been have been forced to do this or decided ourselves to cover up and manipulate evidence to protect ourselves. That's absolute rubbish, and it's not a single statement that we've made or written that said that. Right. So I mean, you know, I, I I think one yeah, important yeah, aspect here that too, right, is that to even suggest it, I mean, frankly. even if this was true, I mean, why would our funding be dependent? on this must be a natural virus, right? My, my funding is not, I mean, in fact, I have grants written about biosecurity and potential engineered pathogens, right? Is that that whole thing from the get-go is, is just false. But also, Eddie it, has different funding sources than Andrew does, than Bob does, than, than I do, and then invite Christian Drosten and Ron Fougier and... Marion Koopsman and others from, from you know, Europe <laughs> on a conference call like this, right? Is that the, the basic idea here of the cover just doesn't make sense from that. But what has to be very clear is that underlying all of this lies it's that the lab leak was disfavored and the natural origin was favored. That must be true, right? Because if that isn't actually true, everything else falls away. But here's the thing, it is untrue, right? There is no favored hypothesis here. I actually came into, again, as you have seen from my emails, believing quite strongly in the lab leak, and so did Eddie, right? And the suggestion that, look, whatever you guys find, you should consider writing a paper on it, right? Because that's how science works. And I was not really in favor of the paper early on. I actually just yeah. wanted to have the conversations, right? But Eddie, for example, was quite like, no, we really got to, you know, write a paper on this. And 
Eddie is clearly more senior than me, right? So he's the, he's the higher ups in, in, in sort of the field of virology. And Eddie was absolutely right, I should add, is that it was actually important to get that paper out, right? But I was a little like, ah, you know, I just, I just kind of want to talk about this for now, and then we take it from there. But this idea that there is a favored hypothesis because of funding, because of like, it's just false. It's flat out false, yeah. right? Yeah. And 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 again, it just doesn't make any sense when you look at the makeup of, for example, of, yeah. of the paper or the conference yeah. call, because everybody comes from different places and have different funding. Right. It doesn't that make any sense. Call was, yeah. So that conference call was not there, was not designed to write the Prox Origins paper. It no. was designed to understand where this virus came from. That's where we had the teleconference discussions. The paper, and I've heard again in the GOP, they've said that Fauci divide you know, we we started this teleconference to write the proxy monitors papers absolutely false categorically false okay we wanted to, to determine the origins so we had a meeting we discussed it we wrote summaries and then quite late on in the process it all came together very quickly quite late on in the process we decided let's write a paper that that was a proper scientific discussion that's how and that's how scientists work you change your mind on the basis of data I changed my mind pretty quickly, actually, on the basis of data. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have been a scientist, right? And I will, I will, you know, I will, I don't regret a single thing that we did in those weeks. That was the right thing to do. Yeah, and just just to be clear, right, is that there's a difference between when you start writing your paper and when you have a final paper, right? That's not the same day. I mean, Eddie writes well and fast, right? But it's not like you start a paper on February four. And then all of a sudden, that's the day we wrote the paper, right? And the paper was with exactly the same conclusions and the final published paper. That's not how the scientific process works, right? It, it, it really isn't. And, and I, again, if you want to take these out of context and quote mine emails and quote mine what people have said, sure, you can, you can build a story whichever way you want. But if you look at the actual emails, now you have all the drafts of the papers and the summaries and all of this has been released too, right? And what you can see is clearly a stepwise process from early on scrambling to try and understand what's going on here to a gradual increase in the understanding of, you know what, here is what our current thinking is on this. And then importantly, that comes with a peer-reviewed published paper in the end right hmm. not a medium post not a twitter thread not a whatever peer-reviewed published papers and we have since have three others of those that sort of continues that process and we're not done yet right because we are you know it points straight to that market in the middle of wuhan right but what happened upstream in that market what animals are we talking about what farms are we talking about all these different things we don't actually understand right and of course that's important to get a more full understanding of why did this actually happen and of course we're continuing to to investigate these questions right this is not a process that just stops it continues and and just briefly for my own part um i uh if if i was being driven by sort of my my own personal incentives having proposed that letter in science saying we've got to take the lab leak um hypothesis seriously if i was just going to make data up um i think it would have worked out better if i had um you know if if um well, that, let let me step away from talking about making data up because that's not the. the... <laughs> you'd, you'd be playing nine dimensional <laughs> chess, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> you, you had said if, we need if, the investigator. If, if, if the evidence mind. were going to break one way or the other, um, it would have been probably better f for how I sort of came off in this whole thing. Um, if it had broken in favor of the lab leak, because I was the person who proposed that letter, which was kind of the big turning point in how it was publicly um, uh, viewed. And I had done a similar thing with the origin of HIV, where you know um, there was this idea that it was also a lab leak. And I'd actually traveled to the Eastern Congo during the Civil War, um, almost died. And unfortunately, my colleague, Bill Hamilton, did die on that trip. Um, and again, I would have looked pretty clever if 
we had found that in the Eastern Congo connected to this lab, there had been um, the descendants of those animals were, were clearly um, uh, the had viruses showing that that population was the source of the AIDS pandemic. Evidence didn't work out that way. Um, and just the whole notion that people like Eddie and Christian and I that have spent our careers just trying to pin down how these things are going to emerge so that we can try to um, do our best in whatever we c- way we can to prevent or at least mitigate uh, these things from happening in the future would um, not just try to f- figure out how this pandemic occurred um, is just a, 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 yeah. Just, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, so yeah. I, I, I'm kind of sickening, but you know, yeah. I, I might actually interject here because um, we don't have much commentary to make on uh, virology because Chris and I know nothing about it. But you know, one thing I do know something about being a, a researcher for 20 something years and gotten about $6 million in research funding myself is about incentives and academia and just generally how it works, the, the sociology of it. So I certainly did cringe having to ask you guys that question because it portrays a cartoonish image of of the, the the various incentives at play. Um, as you said, Mike, being the contrarian, being being the person that goes, "Ah, uh-huh, guys, actually, you, you're discounting the lab, but it is. It, it could be the lab, like or, or whatever, some alternative explanation." That's that is gold in terms of yeah. uh, our, our reputation. I mean, in psychology, we recently had this thing called the re- re- replication crisis, where we absolutely demolished <laughs> the reputation of, of of our field generally and of, of certain <laughs> subfields in particular. And the people who did it were psychologists, right? They weren't people from outside the field, sort of amateurs, you know, figuring out what was going on. Um, and of course, why on earth would you know, people like yourselves who have got no personal connection to actually, you know, handling these purported viruses in labs in, in, in a lab in Wuhan. There, there's obviously no social costs involved in it turning out that way. So, uh, well, I but mean, yet, yeah. I, I think the only incentive here, right, is to do good science. I mean, that that's, I mean, we are all pretty well published researchers, right, that have studied the emergence of viruses for a long time and eddie is sort of yeah you know, eddie is the grandfather yeah right but but what's important here is that we have built our careers on doing good work and good work comes down to what is the evidence and how do we analyze it properly and how do we interpret it properly And that's why, again, disconnecting, asking the question, could this have come from the lab versus once you have asked that question, what do you then do next? And if what the next thing you do is that you talk about the cabal of virologists or how everybody is covering up or deleting things and doing whatever, is that now you're not doing science. Even if you have a PhD, right? That doesn't matter. That's not science, right? That's speculation and innuendo. And here, again, it's it's also an accusation of, of individual scientists, right? Is that th- there the incentive structure, incentive structure for us is not that it must be this or it must be that. It's just that whatever we do, it's got to be solid science, right? There's just no other way than that solid science. And that's why, again, when you look at our studies, they're peer-reviewed and they're published in good journals, right? And we make all of our conclusions available that that way. And that's a slow process, right? I can't compete. Like some of these people spend all day on Twitter, right? Having contributed nothing to the understanding of this pandemic, the origin of this pandemic, or previous pandemics or epidemics, or outbreaks or anything, right? Because it's not what they did prior to this pandemic. And that's not an ad hominem, I can't say that, okay, <laughs> on, on those individuals. It's simply just pointing out that there are people that have spent their entire careers a- asking these kinds of questions, right? And then there are people that haven't, but gotten very, very obsessed with this lab leak. But again, you look at the quote unquote evidence they bring forward, like the diffuse proposal, for example, is that it's meaningless, right? Right. 
it's it's absolutely meaningless. It's 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 not scientific. I I Matt and I, you know, we have expertise in different things, but one of the things that we spend a lot of time around, maybe you are starting to spend the same amount of time, but is conspiracy communities right. and the way that they treat experts, right? And the patterns that we've seen in the way that virologists are treated in the pandemic, it's the exact same as uh, climate scientists were treated, exact same as the way structural engineers were treated with the um, 9-11 uh, collapse, right? So it, the really, I'm, I'm showing my hands a little bit, but there's a clear playbook and it involves taking emails out of context, portraying things as conflicts of interest, whereas the scientists are constantly referring to, no, it's because of all these competing lines of evidence that are coming together to the, you know, the conclusion that global warming is real, that the towers collapsed uh, because of the planes that flew into them and and so on. And uh, I, I guess I, I feel, again, I'm very conflicted about putting this point to you, but I, I think it's important because the one aspect which does get brought up is that um, even if you set aside the more lurid conspiracism around, you know, that you're all just trying to get grants from Tony Fauci and, and that's what it's all about. That, so you you covered up a global pandemic. Like, I think for most people, they should realize uh, when they speak spend time speaking to or seeing just experts instead of seeing them on you know fox news clips that it that it is a ludicrous presentation but i one one of the lines of argument that i think probably has more purchase is that uh virologists have been involved uh, some virologists at least in gain of function research right in uh taking pathogens and making them potentially more infective to uh possibly you know, or very, very likely with good motives, right, to try and ascertain how to prevent future pandemics. But the the argument is made that, okay, so if this was ongoing, wherever it may be, Wuhan or wherever, that virologists would have a, a collective uh, interest in n trying to make sure that that work is not prohibited, right, because... Uh, whatever way you were to present it, that people are like arrogantly thinking that they um, can do so without consequence, or that the, or that it's an important thing to to do to stop future pandemics. But in in that case, I've I've noticed from listening to virologists that there's a whole host of different opinions about the relative trade-offs with gain of function research, and there's a consistent. Um, through line that everybody agrees we need good safety protocols we should be closely regulating this research but i i wonder for each of you the the gain of function research issue is that separate to this or is it interrelated like are you all three in agreement on uh the relative trade-offs for gain of function research or is that question so politicized now that it, it basically is impossible to answer i mean i think i mean a few first of all gain of function research is a bit of a nebulous term right it not all of virology is gain of function right if you look at like true and true gain of function research is actually pretty rare but it depends on how you define it Right, the 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 J and J vaccine, for example, is a result of gain of function, right? Because you you attain a new function in creating that vaccine, for example. But it's also loss of function because it's no longer the 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 function of the old virus, right? But I think what's important here is that, of course, we all care about biosafety and biosecurity, and that is important to all of us and none of us do gain of function research right and most of us work on computers and do computational research my lab is a little different but most of that is is, is to fo focus on that but then there's a separate conversation around biosafety for example which nobody wants to do anything unsafely right <laughs> but you can believe that it actually came out of nature and think that biosafety is important too and even you can believe, too, that in the light of the pandemic, for example, we have learned a lot about how common these SARS-like coronaviruses and SARS-2-like coronaviruses are. We have learned about, you know, how much they can be combined and how prevalent they are. So, for example, to the question of 
should we manipulate these viruses in biosafety level two conditions, for example, is a good conversation to have. Saying in the light of the pandemic that we now saw a major pandemic of a SARS like coronavirus, should we maybe rethink our biosafety regulation around how we sample these viruses, how we manipulate them in the lab? And I think this is an example of I don't I'm not I'm undecided on these questions, right? But I think this is an example on which a conversation and discussion is critically important but it's fully unrelated to understanding the, the, the origin of this pandemic, right? They're totally separate conversations. And you would be shocked to learn that, you know, biologists are actually capable of having both of them, right? Again, these are not mutually exclusive. Of course, biosafety is important. And I think anybody would agree, uh, would agree on that. Mm. Now, yeah. we've, we've taken a lot <laughs> of your time uh, today and you've been extremely indulgent um there's there is minor other qu things that we could get into but i think in you know in hold that anybody that's listened this far they should have a better understanding of of why it is that the it's presented in in for example the map uh, Ridley and the Lena Chan interview that there's this big divergence between vi virologists and the public, and and why is that right? And and their answer is conflict of interests, uh, like naivety in dealing with the authorities. But I think that after listening to this, hopefully people have a better understanding that no, it's because of scientific evidence and the processes of science. But I I did have a question that I wanted to ask each of you because. You've each continued to publish on this topic um, in various ways. You're presented as, you know, the <laughs> like conspiracy members or uh, with varying degrees of responsibility. And I'm I'm just curious, like for for you personally, um, as scientists who have like been working on viruses, um, how has the pandemic been with being targeted and you know dealing with the conspiracy communities is it has it like not had much of that much of an impact on your life or is it something you have to deal with every day i'm i'm just curious how far you're able you know what the personal impact is on you and how far you're able to kind of hold it at arm's length Eddie, <laughs> maybe start for you. Well, better than I was. I mean, <clears throat> I was initially very shocked by the hate that was coming through. And during a bit middle of 2021, um, it became a bit too much for me. I think I just, I couldn't, I mean, it was, it was continuous, right? And I just didn't, I, I didn't, um, I had a lot of, you know, threats it was, it was bad so I, I went off i went off twitter for a long 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 time in that off period i've kind of come a bit harder you know and um all grown so weird i don't care anymore <laughs> so i'm much less bothered by it and it's still continuous after i published this thread yesterday on twitter right i just get you know this tsunami of stuff comes back to me um it doesn't it now it doesn't affect me as much as it did for a while right i think i think for all of us i i i don't like being the public eye at all i don't i don't that's not my natural position i want to be kind of a back i'm a backroom person and suddenly be in the in the forefront every single time right it's a bit <laughs> weird it's because i work on emerging viruses and so yeah yeah i think it's a long-winded answer um I, I think I struggled for a bit, but now I'm kind of, you know, I'm okay with it. Yeah, it uh, it definitely uh, can sap your energy, even if you want to treat it like, you know, it's water off a duck's back. Um, it uh, when when you're reading horrible things that are untrue it still kind of gets to you. Um, but uh, almost worse than, than that, because at the end of the day, you can kind of remind yourself that uh, um, as uh, Bill Hamilton's sister, Mary, uh, once said to me about uh, similar 
stuff happening with lab leak theories with HIV. Uh, these jibes are beneath you. So I sometimes just to remind myself that, uh, that, that, that that's the case. Um, but it's such a huge time sink away from doing productive scientific research to try to sort of do these rear guard attempts to, to deal with the stuff um, that is, you know, the misinformation and a particularly the disinformation and just the amount of, um, you know, Hello? projects that I would have been able to do and are still on my to-do list um, that I haven't been able to do because so much of my time has been uh, eaten up with that is really depressing. And I think that's the case for a lot of us who work on pandemic origins, that it's, uh, there's been a huge um, chunk of, uh, of discovery uh, and collaboration that's just been taken off the table because of, uh, of this stuff. And that's uh, frustrating. frustrating. Yeah, I think, I mean, from, from my perspective, I'll say it, it has been hard and, and, and it is hard. And, 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 you know, it's, it's not just, it's not just me, right? It's, it's my family too. It's, it's my lab as well. And I think people need to understand that, you know, I have a job, right? I, I have a lab of 25 people that have very diverse projects, most of which are not on SARS-2 or COVID. And we have whole programs here in San Diego around, you know, wastewater surveillance. We are building programs like you know, outbreak.info. Some people can go in and understand variants, for example. And I lead our programs in, in Africa, too, which are focused on, on, you know, Lhasa and Ebola, for example. And I have to spend all my time on that. And the time I spend on origin research and that I've been spending on origin research is, is relatively small compared to what I've been spending on all the other stuff, which is trying to understand what the hell is going on with this pandemic and with, with this virus, right? And building the tools and working with public health and working in global health to make these things happen is hard work. And then at the same time, having to deal with the misinformation and the disinformation, much of which is, is directly targeted at me, um, but also targeted towards my colleagues, is, is of course that's hard, right? I'll say I'm, 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 I'm relatively good at just tuning out the crazy, right? But it ultimately gets to you because you have to deal with it. And now I very specifically do have to deal with a lot of it. and. Importantly, too, is that I'm not when I'm talking about conspiracy theorists, I'm not talking about people who believe that this came out of a lab. There's many reasons why people might believe this came out of a lab. And that's fine. Right. Again, the question itself is fine. And if you haven't looked at the evidence or you get all your information from, you know, Fox News or other news media, right, is that you and you're not, you know, expert in viral evolution and emergence is that you could be excused of thinking that this, you know, likely came from the lab. And that doesn't make you a conspiracy theorist. The problem is that if you're looking at a lot of the amplifiers out here um, that talk about this on Twitter constantly, all the time, they are conspiracy theorists, right? And they're very specifically conspiracy theorists because they're talking about how myself and my colleagues and, well, <laughs> now it's all of science, right? Because the conspiracy only gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, um, is that somehow there's this cover up and these cabals, right? That if that's what you're spending your time on to try and bolster your claim that you believe this came from, from a lab, right? Then, then you are a conspiracy theorist by definition. And that's where, you know, again, many of these people, they, they, they don't seem like they have anything other than to sit on Twitter all day and spew hate, attack colleagues, you know, never have any of them produced any, you know, primary research on trying to understand the origin of this pandemic, right? Or any other pandemic, because as I'm saying, 
most of these people, if not all of them, in fact, never studied these kinds of questions prior to the pandemic, right? They come from completely unrelated fields and have no expertise, many of them. And that's obviously tiring, right? Because we are here trying to do good work. We publish it in, you know, scientific journals, but we care about the science communication aspect of this. I was very active on Twitter, right? And the reason I was active on Twitter was basically three different reasons. One was that I really enjoyed talking to colleagues and meeting new potential collaborators on Twitter. That was awesome, right? I couldn't do that anymore. Then I thought it was important to you know, tell about our research, our findings here from San Diego, or our findings from Africa as part of our research. What are we actually finding? And just communicating around that and the pandemic itself, in my opinion on that. I thought that was important too. And then the last aspect of that, which I thought was really important, which is just engaging with the public. Because there are a lot of people out there that have very reasonable questions around a lab leak, for example, have reasonable questions about the vaccines or about the pandemic or should we wear face masks and all these things. And these are very reasonable questions. And I was there to engage with the public to give my view on this. All of these things were very enjoyable. The problem is that in the end, I, I couldn't do that because it got completely drowned out, out by the crazy conspiracy theories on a daily basis. And then Twitter leadership came, came in and then now we're going to change everything. And it's like, you know what? This is actually my cue to, to get off this platform because I'm not actually capable of fighting the conspiracy theories or trying to make it better or people better understand the mere fact that I am here contributing to this particular platform means that I become part of the problem. So when I realized that I was like, I just, I just have to leave now because I can't spend time trying to do this, right? It's a losing battle. So from that perspective, yes, it has obviously affected me. I'll say it upended my life, right? And it's continuing. And it's not just affecting me. It's affecting, again, everybody in my lab, my colleagues, my family, right? And based on, you know, conspiracy theories. Based on, that, based on the fact oh, we, we wrote a paper, Christian. Exactly. Paper. Based on the fact that we have had the nerve to write scientific papers of mm. primary research and understanding the origin of the pandemic, mm. right? I mean, that is incredibly frustrating. And yes, of course, that's tiring. Yeah. And I, I, will I will just say, um, I uh, I feel like what uh, Zheng Li Shi has experienced is um, certainly on a totally different level than me. I mean, what Christian has experienced and Eddie is on a different level than me, but Shi, uh, Zheng Li Shi, I think, is on a different level altogether. And uh, so I don't feel sorry for myself, but I certainly... My heart goes out to to her. I mean, I think this this is also an, an important aspect of this, right? Because we are very privileged, right? We have good jobs. We have kept those jobs during the pandemic. We can work from home. We can do all these things, right? So it also brings up this that like, well, but who am I to, you know, think that this is tough? Because there's a lot of other people out there that have it a lot tougher than we do, right? Whether it has to do with the conspiracy theories or just dealing with the pandemic in general. But that doesn't change the fact that while all of that is absolutely true, right? It doesn't change the fact that while specifically what we are dealing with here too is hard, right? And I think acknowledging that I do think is important because at the end of the day, you can sit there and spew hate on Twitter and constant attacks, right? And you can talk about how it was the virus was engineered or whatever, but it brings it back to the scientists, to our people, right? Yeah. Is that this is not just a little hypothesis that you have. No, it's a very specific accusation, right? Yeah. And I think that's important because at the end of that accusation, there are actual people, right? Mm -hmm. Xi Jinping very specifically has been trying to understand these viruses for the best part of her, her, her career, right? And that's then become the focus here. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely very sad to see. Uh, yeah, that, that's the kind of uh, 
reward you get, I guess, for <laughs> specializing in an important <laughs> field for 30 years. But, you know, I think it's great to wrap up on that point, which, which is those personal reflections. I mean, and also that, that role about science communication. And I'm, we're very much aware that you've spent over two hours uh, talking with us, um, answering somewhat stupid questions um, in the pursuit of this. And, you know, most of the time when people go on podcasts or on social media generally, they're promoting a popular book they're hoping to sell lots of copies of or they are hoping to do some sort of cross promotion for their social media profile but working scientists like yourselves and we'll flatter ourselves of including ourselves here too i mean there, there, there's no benefit to this in, in, in spending two hours of your life um, um talking with us so um i think it is done very much um for the very best of motives so Thank you all for either getting up early or staying up late, as the case may be. Yeah, and and just to say that uh, I know, Christian, you've uh, retreated for very good reasons from from Twitter. But uh, on behalf of myself, and I suspect I speak for many people, I have found the work that you guys have done and the science communication efforts that you've been put in. Um, extremely valuable so i think there's there's many people that you know are not the conspiracy minded people that you might hear from a lot that that have benefited from the efforts that you've put in and yeah i the only thing i can say is that it's likely something else will come along in in uh, you know a couple of years that will attract the attention because this is what tends to happen so it's not really any consolation for what you're dealing with now but um nonetheless uh hopefully it'll pass and uh yeah just to echo matt thanks so much for spending the time uh to explain to us and to the audience and hopefully people have a better grasp about the scientific issues and the relevant evidence around it and and now it should at least be put to bed even for the the hardcore lab like people you you are okay to talk about this and you have responded to the point so i i know this is potentially the hundredth time you've done so but it, it just keeps being said that you don't do this but but you clearly do so um so yeah thanks thank you yeah thank you everybody okay okay